let's first I'll, on page three of your bulletin, on the hymn number, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending, the number should be 222. Does anyone else have any announcements? Becky? I am otherwise occupied, but at 1.30 this afternoon at the Wyoming Theater, there's an announcement made, there's a movie, it's called Unplanned, and some couple has graciously agreed to pay for anybody who wants to come, so it's free admission, it's at 1.30 at the theater, it's Unplanned, it's about abortion movie about abortion, and I haven't seen it, I've, I've seen the trailer, and I've read a lot about it, and I've heard a lot of talk about it, uh, on things that I listen to. And the target audience is not necessarily those who are already against abortion, or those who will fight for it till their dying breath. It's for that great swath of Americans in the middle that think that they're pro-choice. And I am not going to interfere with somebody else's decision. It's up to them. I'm not going to be judgmental or anything like that. It's about what actually, and it's not graphic, okay, it's not blood and guts, but it actually depicts what an abortion is. And it has changed a lot of minds of the people who think they're pro-choice, okay, from at least I have to wrestle with what actually happens during that procedure. So if you have any friends that you think would benefit from that type of movie, and it's a, it's a good movie, I haven't seen it, but all the reviews I've read, it's at 1.30 this afternoon at the theater. Um, they rated it R because they don't want a lot of Christians to go to it, a lot of Christians, Mormon church, you can't go, it's R rated. They did that on purpose, the powers that be, because they don't want people watching this movie. Now, I have read, if you've got a 12, 13, 14 year old, they can go to this movie. Now, as a matter of policy, they have to, the parent or guardian would have to sign a petition so for them to go if they're under 17. So that's this afternoon at 1.30 at the theater. Thank you, Herb. Anyone else? Please stand and join for the entree. On your red book, number 111.
Please be seated. <laughs> now the opening invocation by Nate. Please join with me in prayer. Our Father, we have just sung that you are exalted. You are reigning. We're reminded of the, not just the cry of dereliction from the cross, my God, my God, why, has you, why have you forsaken me? But we are also in remembrance of it is finished. And so, Lord, the work has been done, it is finished, and you are reigning on the very right hand of God himself. And now we navigate this period between the work accomplished and your return, in which you will bring all nations and all individuals before your throne of justice and the books will be open, books of deeds, sins of commission, and omission. And then, Lord, the thoughts and intents of hearts. That day, Lord, we will therefore see, I think, this seeming undecipherable reign of yours in which you are raining down judgment in the present which you are also orchestrating to extend your kingdom we will see perhaps that beautiful side of the tapestry more clearly in fuller measure than before but here we walk by faith, not by sight. And indeed, your kingdom doesn't seem to be reigning, unless, of course, we focus on who you are and the promises that you've given us. And so, in a sense, Lord, you remain hidden, even though you have come and performed a great work and have revealed what that great work is and what it means for each of us. And so this already not yet, both in terms of sin within and the promises that you have given us, makes for a, well, a very special time that has pleased you to see people trust in you. And so, Lord, make our lives see that and possess it and own it because this thing called experience between your finished work and your return is something that you greatly delight in. But we must remain focused and we must reach out and own your promises. And so, Lord, this hour, I pray that you will give us your promises afresh and that you will work so work in our hearts that we will reconnect with your promise of favor, forgiveness, empowerment, and proclaimed victory. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Please join me in our confession of sin. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let us confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Heavenly Father, your, your Son's work of redemption is finished. While our flesh with his desires have been crucified with Christ, making us truly justified. We are yet encumbered with the resident of sin. We desire and we wish that. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess, yet not fully. 
It is this waiting, this not yet, that in part causes our hearts to be heavy in ways that we cannot fully understand. We sin because we are yet sinners. Forgive us, O Lord, and renew us, that we may delight in your will, and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have confessed together we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making us our conscience feel is transgression. Nevertheless, even in the midst of his judgments, his grace reigns supreme. In our place, he has borne the fury of his own righteous wrath. Our guilt is gone. He has also bound the strong man freeing us from his bondage. Therefore, with joyous shouts of hallelujah, I declare to you God's work through Christ alone and forgiveness of sins. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Now join me in the call of praise, Psalm 150. Praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp. Praise him. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And now we'll have the psalm hymn response, Psalm 150 on the screen. Now this is a psalm with music, but it's not being sung. There's a little bit of art and it's bread. It's profound. Worship the Lord. Psalm 150. Praise the eternal. Praise the true God inside his temple. Praise him beneath massive skies, under the moon and the stars and the rising sun. Praise Him for His powerful acts, redeeming His people. Praise Him for His greatness that surpasses our time and understanding. Praise Him with the blasts of trumpets and high into the heavens. And praise Him with harps and lyres and the rhythm of the tambourines skillfully played by those who love and fear the eternal. Praise Him with singing and dancing. Now we'll have a scripture reading with Luke and Susan Johnson. Whoever does not know the scriptures does not know the power of God, nor his wisdom. Ignoring the scriptures means ignoring Christ. Whoever wants to hear God speak should read Holy Scripture. First reading, Acts chapter 5, verse 27 to 32. 
Hear the word of the Lord. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, to give repentance to Israel for the forgiveness of sins. We are witness to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those whom, who obey him. Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is Revelation 1, 1 through 8. The word of the Lord. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, coming, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Gospel reading is taken from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Hear the word of the Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, 
Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The word of the Lord. And now let's stand and sing together number 222, Lo, he comes with clouds descending. And I'm going to attempt to give you some music to it. Um... Okay, we should be ready to go. You have the words in front of you, unlike me. Ah, there it is. Okay, here we go. And saints attending swell the triumph of his reign. Second page there. Alleluia. 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 He turns to rain. Every eye shall now behold him, robed in dreadful majesty. Those who said had not and sold him, pierced and nailed him to the tree, deeply wailing, deeply wailing, deeply wailing, shall the Every island, sea, and mountain, heaven and earth shall flee away. All who hate him must confound it. Hear the trump pro. Judgment, come to judgment, come to judgment. 
judgment come away. Now redemption long expected see in solemn pomp appear all his saints by man rejected now shall meet him in the air Alleluia 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 See the day of God appear Answer Ransomed worshippers with what rapture, with what rapture, with what rapture gaze we on those glorious scars. Yea, amen, let all adore thee, high on your eternal throne. Savior, take the power and glory, claim the King. For your own, oh, come quickly, oh, come quickly, oh, come quickly, everlasting God, come down. Please be seated. Okay, well, um, before we took a look at Psalm 118, we had parts up here on Easter, because Psalm 118 was a liturgical procession into the temple of God with their praise and adoration. And according to the liturgical calendar, we're not supposed to sing or speak of hallelujahs during this Lent time, and therefore the 
liturgical readings focus on that which they were not singing during Lent. Now, I don't follow jot and tittle on this because I just don't. But it is going to be a focus here. Alleluia. It's the praise of God. And what is praise? We say, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. I think I said that numerous times before I found out what Alleluia means. And it simply means praise. Now, one Hebrew scholar, an evangelical, defines praise this way. It's a glowing, spontaneous description of who God is and what he has done. A glowing, spontaneous description of who God is and what he has done. Now, there's never been a pristine moment in the church that I want to go back to. First of all, that would be an insult to God's providence. I'm created now. This is my time. I had a friend in Hot Springs who was involved in the same dark world that I was a part of. And I heard one morning that he drove up to the mountaintop and put a shotgun under his chin and blew himself away. And the note said, born in the wrong time, at the wrong place. You see, that's an insult to the providence of God. You're here. You're now. Your breath is from God himself. You are meant to be here. You are meant to be where you are right now. Now it's fraught with tension and such knowledge that my, my tongue can't fully explain how our days are in the hands of God and every moment is from Him. I, I can't put that all together with complete cognitive rest. It's a mystery. David will say regarding God's providence, such knowledge is too high, it's too wonderful for me. You see, there's spontaneous praise for who God is and what he's doing. Now we tend to look at our lives and search for God out there somewhere. How do we know God's will? What do you think God's doing in, in America? What is God doing in the world? But brothers and sisters, God is doing something in your life right now with each breath. Some experiences drive that home. You slip and fall and catch yourself, and if that would not have been there, bye-bye, Nate. I've fallen off a horse more than once. It's probably what's wrong with me upstairs. But I was above Timberline, and for whatever reason, my horse thought he was in a rodeo, and up he went, and down he went. And there was a, there was a precipice that had we rolled, I wouldn't be here. That drives home that, wow, God wants me here. The survivors of tragedy, you know what haunts them? Why me? Why did I survive that? And God drives home his providential care and control of history during those moments. But the fact is, as you breathe right now, that's one of those moments. It's just not impressed upon us as sentient, finite creatures until something happens out of the ordinary. So, praise is the glowing, spontaneous description of who the Lord is and what he has done. Now, I said I don't want to go back to a place and time of history. You see it on the lips of so many. Oh, I want to go back to the New Testament church. You can have it. I mean, if you've read scripture, read the Corinthians, read the Galatians. I mean, they're just steeped in idolatry. They're, they're steeped in, in, in paganism. They're, they're steeped in all kinds of things. Paul had a terrible lot for his life. I don't want to go back. 
Because one, it's providential, I'm here, this is my time. But secondly, there is no pristine time. And the church fought over contemporary music. It split the church and it's still fighting now. Now, mostly contemporary music, contemporary worship has won over. That's why we're all gray haired here, have you noticed? And no hair. But, you know, there's a difference in preference and a difference in what's right and what's wrong. Psalm 150, I'm sorry, is unequivocal affirmation to bring all that we have before the Lord in worship, including dance. Now, I did a little research on what that dance meant. It, it probably was a liturgical uh, leading of the psalm singing, and maybe the psalmists were also the dancers. It's not really clear. We can't know for sure, but Psalm 50 is praise the Lord. Praise the Lord in his sanctuary or in his holiness in the heavens. Perhaps both here on earth in the sanctuary, the earthly human sanctuary, and the heavens above. And we're following, in case you haven't noticed, Psalm 150 in the call to praise. We are to praise him. And with trumpet sound, with lute and harp, could be the same instrument, they don't know. With a tambourine and dance, and with the strings and the pipe, with loud sounding, with sounding cymbals, with loud clashing cymbals, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so therefore, I, I squirm when I hear, not preference, but I hear silly statements like, well, you bring drums and guitars in here and I'm out of here. You know, this is like wrong. It's not wrong. Every musical instrument that Israel had was called upon to offer praise, including dance. And sometimes it's a challenge for us curmudgeons to get out of our circle of familiarity and be open to fresh leadings of the Spirit. Now I'm preaching to you. I'm, I'm, I'm pressing your conscience. Now if there were young people over here and I could turn and there were young people, I would say, you see, tradition isn't just empty and hollow. Uh, Israel had a specific litur liturg uh, liturgical expression and it's not just dead rote memorization. We recite the Apostles' Creed for a reason. You see, it's not just formalism. As a matter of fact, in your informalism, you have your own formalism. You've created a whole passive lot of worshipers. They come in with their uh, uh, latte and they sit down and you give them a show and they stand up and sing maybe and then they leave and go shopping. So we must be careful. This is an already not yet in the world, in the church, in our homes, and in our hearts. And when your enemy is always those outside of you, I would caution you. I need to preach to myself. I'm very familiar with the enemies around me and I can get into that mode and talk eloquently and abundantly. But what about the enemy here? We must let scripture speak, we say, who are Bible believing. This is scripture. Bring what you have and praise the Lord. Jesus said, if you refuse to praise me, I will call upon the rocks and they will cry out in worship of who I am and what I have done. That means, brothers and sisters, that if we refuse to praise him, we can be bypassed. Now, in verse 1, L1, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens or the heavenly so it's a it's a call for all creatures who are in some sense moral motions that have moral motions to acknowledge their creator in verse 2 or c2 Praise him for his mighty deeds praise him according to his excellent greatness so so there 
explains what the spontaneous praise and description of who and what God is comes to bear. It's taken from the text itself. It calls us to praise him in verse 1, but in verse 2 it says to praise him for certain things, for his mighty deeds, for his excellent greatness. I have a pastor friend whom Susan and I met in Yellowstone, and, and uh, he now is pastor at... Uh, an institution in Ohio that Kay's family uh, is, was intimately involved with, and he's, his title is Pastoral Excellence. And here, this is what it's about. We're to praise God for what he's done and his excellent greatness, which is what we're looking at at the open barrel. God's greatness we covered, his largeness. And then his oneness, and next we'll, we'll celebrate his wisdom. You see, we're called upon to do this. And I think it's Roy's favorite hymn, is it not? Uh, uh, send me or something to that effect. What is it? Here I, am. Here I am, Lord. It's a beautiful hymn. Right from the text of Isaiah 6. Here I am, send me, and collectively, here we are, send us, Lord. That is our calling. That's what we're supposed to do in terms of resources, talent, and time. Time, talent, and treasure. We're to answer God's call to praise him and to go out and tell the whole world to praise him. There's the drums. I, I, I just didn't think you would like it, so I kept them down in the basement. Now, if that's Roy's favorite text, I'm sure he knows what follows. Isaiah says, here I am. You see, God's world always carries with it a response, an obligatory response. And this is where our tradition sometimes loses the tension. You see, your response is to, to believe and to trust and obey, even to the extent where Paul says in the King James Version, mortify the deeds of the flesh. In other words, cut them off, that hyperbolic communique of Jesus himself on the Sermon of the Mount. If your eye offends, you, offends God, pluck it out. If your arm Cut it off. You see, there's a response that's built into God's revelation. Yes, there's the elect world. Yes, not one of the elect will not show. But in this mysterious thing called existence is the demand and the call for you to trust and believe. And it it's, comes from within. That glowing, spontaneous description. Now, keeping with Roy's favorite text... Isaiah appropriately responds, here I am. And you know what God says? You're going here. Go. Oh, Isaiah, they won't listen to you. Now, I've been in this vocation for quite a while, and, <laughs> you know, on Monday morning, it's... How many were there Sunday? How many were there last year at this time? And, you know, this is that, this is that. And numbers just drive effectiveness, and God's really moving. But here, Isaiah went and preached what God told him to preach, and no one listened. Now, was Isaiah out of the will of God? Was God withholding blessing because of Isaiah's secret sins somewhere? No. The text is very clear on this. God's word goes out and changes sinners into saints. Side one of the coin. You flip it over. God's word goes out and hardens those who resist his rule and reign. Both are works of God. And so, brothers and sisters, 
I like numbers, and I'm, those who know me know that I'm troubled by a lack of numbers here and a lack of numbers at an event and the potential event that's coming and will our own people even come and this and that and I, I'm plagued by it but scripture tells us faithful proclamation and the results are God's end of story hold me accountable for effort I work seven days a week and I take Sabbath moments I'll Line that up against anybody's record. But we must be faithful. And our faithfulness is telling the world and us every week who he is and what he has done. His excellent greatness. Let everything that has breath. Now that word breath in the Hebrew goes back to the creation of Adam and Eve where God breathed into him the breath of God and he became a living soul. Everything that has that kind of breath is under the obligation to praise the Lord. And some people say, you know, you're too political. But you see, nations are under the obligation just as individuals are. Now they're not under the obligation to be the church, but they are under the obligation for God's minimal standard of morality that's reflected in the Amago Dei, the image that's imprinted within them for maximum human flourishing. And some Christians draw a hard wedge between there. They've been poisoned by the people who think there's a separation of church and state. In some absolute sense, there's just none. The absolute sense that Jefferson talked about in his letter had to do with protecting the church from the intrusion of the state. But the states, the nations are under obligation. That's why God punishes nations collectively and covenantally. Every human being and every nation is under a covenant with his maker whether they realize it or not. Now, John's revelation, Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, sorry. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ, verse 1, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now, notice in there, I mean, look what the means, the methods that God uses. First of all, God gave to him in order to, purpose clause, show to his servants in verse 1. That's the purpose of the revelation that Jesus Christ actually gave. Which then he gave to John and God's purpose is to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Now the means. He gave, he made it known by sending his angel. And then he sent the angel to John. And now John is speaking to the church. But not only the church. Because in verse 3, look at what it says. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Now this is Christian worship. The words aloud. Yeah, some people complain we have too much scripture here. But you see the early liturgical church in the history of the church and the text itself says that the reading, the public reading of God's word was dominant in early worship. In the New Testament, in the period shortly after the New Testament, and that's why I was critiquing the contemporary worship over here. Some singing, latte, and you listen to someone who's a polished speaker, and you go home. There's something vitally missing there. Now, those who hear, and those who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. See, now, John had a sense of writing. 
John had a sense that this document was going to be read. So he has hearers in mind and he has readers in mind. And scripture is clear that scripture is the word of God. I think Kurt mentioned it when he says regarding Jerome, whoever does not know the scriptures does not know the power of God nor his wisdom. Ignoring the scriptures means ignoring Christ. And we mustn't have that burden. God doesn't want us to have that burden of not listening, of not reading, because that equates to not knowing Christ, which means we lack spontaneous worship for the excellence of his name and what he has done. So both the hearers and the written text which means the world now reads this text of what is about to happen. So you have Jesus, you have God through Jesus Christ, his faithful servant, to his angel, to his servant John, who then speaks and expects the church to read and teach, and then a written document that goes to the whole world. You see how this all flows regarding how God brings his bride to himself. Now, couldn't God circumvent all of that? He could, but this is God's good pleasure. And he chooses certain means. Now, we have scripture, and so we have no more private revelations that are on par with the authority of scripture. So, so gone is the angel to bear witness to a personal revelation. What we have now is the written text. We have the voice of God in the text, and that's what Jerome was talking about. Bible-believing churches need to be saturated in the text. You individually and personally need to be saturated in the text. And I hear people all the time, it's the biggest mistake for a new believer. I started reading the Bible in Genesis, praise God, I, my soul got saved. They make it maybe to Leviticus, and then they drop it, and then they feel guilty, and then they hear a sermon about the Word of God, and they try it again. Look, brothers and sisters, this is a complicated book. Now, the message of salvation is so simple that a toddler, I think, can truly hear and grasp it. But to understand the text requires time, requires effort, time, talent, and treasure to understand the text. And so, that's why the angelic intermediary and the private revelations now have ceased. We have the full text. Are you bathing in it? Are you like a cow with four stomachs, chewing and regurgitating and chewing and regurgitating the word? Or is this a Sunday stop by? We all have to ask ourselves that question. Now verse five. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Now there's the full humanity of Jesus. He alone is the faithful witness. What other, what, what other phrases come to mind? Why, why is there a need of a faithful witness? Because the first Adam was an unfaithful witness. He, he was silent in the face of Eve's temptation. And as his head, he, he did not apparently say anything. He stood by and watched his wife, whom God had created out of him, to form a mystical union uh, and also a real physical union of a husband and, and a wife. And he, he just stood by, refusing to bear witness to what God had said. And so we needed a new faithful witness, one who was without sin. And so here it points to the humanity and to the deity of Jesus Christ in verse 5 here. The faithful witness, the second Adam, the firstborn of the dead. Not a resuscitation, but a resurrection, and a resurrection based on his faithful witness. You see how this all hangs together. We've read this before, but in Romans 1, when Paul writes his most theological 
letter that he's ever written. And he says this regarding Jesus. He was declared to be the Son of God. Declared by whom? By God the Father. Romans chapter 1, verse 4. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness. Well, how was that shown? How, how was power in the Spirit of holiness demonstrating God's declaration? And it says right there in the text, verse 4, by His resurrection. You see, we just had Easter. This is God's witness to the world. And it's the witness to you and to me. And he demands a response. And he demands us to take this witness and bear witness to the world as a faithful witness who follows the only true faithful witness. Why are we doing that? Verse 6 in Revelation. He's made us a kingdom. We're vice regents of God. We have little crowns. And we're ruling and reigning with him. In verse 6, he made us a kingdom. He made us kings. But wait, he also made us priests. To God the Father. To him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. And verse 7, behold, he is coming. You see, if John can write an inspired text and say, I'm coming to you with words that you should read because they contain the information that the time is near and what you need to be looking for. Well, likewise us. As faithful witnesses, we need to bear witness to his coming in the clouds. He's returning. Every eye will see him, even those eyes who pierced him. All the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, wailing, 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 because they've resisted his reign and his rule. And that judgment will be meted out with strict proportional justice, a justice that's intertwined with a fence of an infinite holy God, it is a terrible, terrible thing, brothers and sisters, to be in the hands of that righteous wrath. And if you truly believe that, then we mustn't lose sight of our calling. We must go out, we must invite in, and we must remain faithful. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And now let's stand and confess together. Which, by the way, the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, whom Thomas Schreiner is a part of, and it's the flagship of the Baptists in the United States. It's their flagship. He critiqued recently uh, in his book on the Apostles' Creed, which was just printed this month and released, he critiques the church for not confessing the Apostles' Creed. Now, Baptists are not notoriously known for liturgy. That's, that's the Lutherans, that's the Methodists, that's the Catholics, that's the Presbyterians. And here he is critiquing this inadequate expression. And it's a wonderful book. The Apostles' Creed in the beginning. Creed is a belief. It's what we believe. It's confessing that belief. And that confession is personalized into I believe. That's the beauty of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in the Father. I believe in the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Catholic is universal, not Roman Catholic. This isn't a Roman Catholic creed. And that difficult portion descended into hell, probably originally just meant Christ's descent into earth, into the grave. But he calls upon that non-liturgical denomination, which they don't claim to be a denomination, to reconfess, to bring in the tradition of scripture reading and apostolic confession. So let us do that with gusto and personal, spontaneous praise of who he is and what he has done. Stand with me and let's 
cite together, confess together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Now as vice-regents or kings with a small crown representing the king of glory, and priests with a small p representing the priest of glory, and the small p prophet representing the one and true prophet of glory. We come in this worship that we trust and hope God finds pleasing. And this window is an opportunity to approach your prophet, priest, and king as his representatives and to call upon his name. I will open it up and I will close this, inviting you to follow with the Lord's Prayer. And in between, I invite your responses. They can be just, Lord, help, help us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's our desire that our worship is pleasing to you. And we ask, Lord, that you would search our hearts and speak to us what makes you pleased with worship. Lord God, I pray that you will move in many people throughout, not just Goshen County, but throughout the state of Wyoming and our entire nation this Thursday to come before you in repentance and supplication. I pray that you will cause people to recognize the importance of this, that they will make it a priority, that they will come and that they will pray for our nation, for those in positions of authority, for your church, for our families, for our military, and that they would go away recognizing that it is important to do that, not only on the National Day of Prayer, but every day. Mm -hmm. Amen. Lord, I ask that you bless our worship, what we do here, gathering the Sunday school and the worship service each Sunday. Bless us to remain faithful. We pray that you will draw people to this place to hear your word taught, preached, your sacraments administered. I sense a lack of desire in this community for your word. Um, I pray that you will do that which only you can do, is put that desire in many hearts, put that desired hearts to, to come to our outreach, whether that be the evening Bible studies or the open barrel outreach and the upcoming conference with Dr. Schreiner. We are doing all that we can do in our human strength to present your word we just need you to bring people to hear it. Move in each of us in here to invite those we haven't invited, re-invite those we haven't invited for a while. I know that it's difficult. I know myself I've been accused of nagging people. Um, 
Lord, but only you can put in them the desire. Only you can do that. I thank you for the continued faithfulness of the session. You recognize the Great Commission and the mission that this church has as do all bodies. I recognize the pastor and his faithfulness to preach the word rightly. Um, and I recognize the faith of the congregation to support the session and the pastor. Um, Lord, I don't know what else to, we are at a loss. How do we get people to desire to hear it? We are at a loss. Um, only you can do that. I also pray that you will Merv and move in Merv Mecklenburg and his wife. Merv recognizes at some level your providence in his situation. Deepen that recognition. Uh, deepen that to a degree well, where he turns to you uh, in true saving faith, he and his wife, and all those for whom we pray. God, I pray that you'll be with Roger Butler and his family as they travel back to their home in Oklahoma and take care of Roger and his health issues. Uh, cancer is a troubling thing, and we pray that you'll be giving him strength and the doctor's knowledge. Also, be with Bonnie and Glenn as they are concerned about him and about themselves. We thank you so much for that whole family. Amen. We thank you, Lord, that you have given the opportunity for us to have this church. And uh, we pray that we remain a faithful group who are willing to be sent and who are willing to go out into the world and spread the word. So while we are here in preparation, help us to want to understand the scriptures. And Help us to want to study and to trust and obey you and to prepare to go out. Be with David Grote and his wife as they're dealing with his health issues. Lord, I ask you to be with Tom Dice from Lingo and comfort him and be with him in his upcoming health issues. Yes, Lord. Lord, I ask that you bless that showing of that movie this afternoon at the theater. I pray that you'll be, bring many out to see that. I pray that you'll move in many to bring those who, who don't know where they stand on that issue. Um, that is the issue of the day, really, in this nation. Um, 60 million babies have been killed. Um, it needs to change, and it will only change if you Decide that it should, Lord, and you revive your church. You revive those who have given up even belief in natural law. Just pray again that you will do that which only you can do. Yes, Lord. Lord God, I pray that you will continue to be with Wade and Kay as Wade recovers and just keep both of them strong physically, as well as especially spiritually close to you. Yes, amen. We thank and praise you, dear Lord, for the new Hageman baby and for the, the health of the mother and the health of the baby. And we just pray that, to, that you be with uh, Brett and Kelly and Charlie and now little Stella and uh, just uh, praise and thank you for family. Uh, indeed, amen. And now please join with me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever, amen.
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Empowered as prophet, priest, and king, not distinct from you except in a calling, you too are prophet, priest, and king, but thus the grounding of this liturgical exchange. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. And lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might. Ah, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When our life and of the world have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. On the night that Christ was betrayed, he gathered his disciples and they had a dinner. And when he was finished, he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, This is my body given for you. In the same way, he took the cup of blessing, the third cup in the meal. The blessing cup. And when he had given thanks, he poured the wine, and he said, This is the new covenant. My blood shed for you for the remission of sins. This drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And with those instructions, they partook and they celebrated God's word to them. And I invite you, likewise, with spontaneous praise, to come and hear from him his words of forgiveness and his words of empowerment in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when you're ready, spontaneously so moved by God in praise, come and receive his declaration. The blood of Christ shed for you. 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 Amen. The 
the blood of Christ shed for you. 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 May you heal fast. The blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. The 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 blood of Christ shed for you. Thank you. Thank you. The blood of Christ shed for 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 you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's stand together and sing our closing hymn, number 223, in your songbook. It's a familiar tune, even though the words are new. And you know, I, I've been looking for a criticism since I've been here, uh, and I haven't heard it to my disappointment. I, I have yet to hear a complaint that your friend, spouse, son, or daughter is the worst singer that I've ever heard in my life. One of the ways by which you can warm your heart to God is to sing. I don't care if you sound like a canary, do they? A blackbird. Sing to the Lord. Read and just remember the tune or something if you're that bad. But I'm looking forward to the first complaint that says he or she cannot sing and it's irritating me. Stand up and let's sing together. Number 223. Bring no morn your music, night your starlit silence. Oceans laugh the rapture to the storm winds coursing free. Sun and planets chorus, thou art our creator. Who wert and art and evermore shalt be. Life and death, your creatures, praise you, mighty giver. Praise and prayer are rising in your beast and bird and tree. Though they praise and vanish, vanish at our bidding. Word and art and art. 
lead, lead us, love us, cry your grouping nations, pleading in the thousand tons, but naming only thee. Weaving blindly out your holy, happy purpose, who wert and art and evermore shall be. Star and souls that wayward flee, homeward draws the spirit to your spirit yearning, who wert and art and evermore shalt be. And now John, who wrote the book of Revelation, probably perhaps inspired by Isaiah chapter 49, I give to you God's benediction. I will make your oppressors eat their own flesh, and they shall be drunk with their own blood as with wine. Then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Go in the confidence that God rules and that he reigns. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.